Hi, I'm Jim Leonard, one of the showrunners of Vintage Computer Festival Midwest. On the day we recorded the YouTuber panel discussion, we unfortunately had a video problem that prevented us from recording the video adequately. However, there was someone sitting in the front row who used a 4K camera, on a gimbal no less, to record the entire panel presentation, and they've offered to share that footage with us so that we can repair the entire thing and present it to you. That person was Veronica of Veronica Explains, and she has a YouTube channel herself. If you are interested in bringing your 8-bit system into a modern world or simply learning about Linux, you should definitely check out the channel Veronica Explains. We are indebted to Veronica for sharing this footage with us, and we hope you enjoy the YouTubers panel. Why are any of us? I thought we were the audience and they were the show. Yeah, you're on the show. From my <laughs> point of view, <laughs> How's everyone doing so far? <laughs> My favorite question to ask. Uh, we very much appreciate you uh, adapting to our growing pains. That's one way to put it. Um, and, uh, and we have heard your concerns, and we are adjusting them for next year's show. So thank you for being patient and uh, coming to this uh, wonderful YouTubers panel. Uh, we started this several years ago, and, and we're happy to, that everyone here agreed to do it again. I think we can learn a lot about uh, vintage computer tech, hobby, research, etc., on and off the web. And uh, so I'd like to introduce everyone starting to my left here. This is Mark from the Serial Port. We have Ken from K uh, Computer Clan. We have Sean from Action Retro. Clint Basinger from LGR. Yep. Adrian Black from Adrian's Digital Basement. David Murray from the 8 Bit Guy, June of Nibbles and Bites, and Taylor and Amy from the Taylor and Amy Show. Oh. Nice. How much did you pay them? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions to get things started. Uh, a little after that, if anyone would like to ask questions, we have uh, an actual question and answer mic this time. Uh, so if you could line up uh, behind that so that we can uh, see how many people want to ask questions and ask them in order and be fair and all that stuff, that would be great. Um, and I'd also like to encourage everyone on the panel uh, to just uh, tell me to stop talking and ask each other questions <laughs> if you really want. Um, but I'd like to start with um, something that dragged me back into the hobby in maybe 15 years ago was... Uh, the XTIDE, which lets you add Compact Flash to a system. So this was a homebrew project that literally dragged me back into the hobby. I would be curious to know, are there any homebrew projects, either past or present, that uh, you really appreciate, that assist you with the hobby, that uh, bring, brings joy to you, to the hobby? If any, and, and by the way, when I ask these questions, it's literally to anyone on the panel, anyone who wants to answer. Well, I'm going to jump in first. Do it. And I have to say Blue Scuzzy. Yeah. No, there are some Blue Scuzzy <laughs> folks yep. here today. Thank you so much for your hard work. Yeah, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. You know, so much love and effort has gone into that project, and such a, like a, a cool group of people have put it together and contributed to it. And uh, just the things that it can do to, to bring old computers back to life easily and inexpensively. It's wonderful. And I'll... I'll I am the XDID specifically is one of my favorite things because for troubleshooting all the PCs I go through so quickly, that thing allows me to be much faster about it. But the whole community of these open source projects blow my mind because RGB to HDMI is another incredible one. The the blue SCSI and that stuff is amazing. This all these things that allow us to <laughs> keep these old junk computers working still <laughs> is is like frankly amazing and like the i mean even the apple II vga card david's upstairs who's demonstrating that uses a raspberry pi it's software defined i mean this stuff is amazing and it it doesn't take away i th my opinion is using something modern doesn't take away from the the awesome feeling of using this computer it just makes it easier because you don't need to find a crt that works and you don't need a hard drive that works and you don't need all this stuff right so yeah it just it's amazing and I have to say it's the uh, Ultimate 1541. Um, that cartridge has really revolutionized how I do software development on the 128. I was doing the usual thing of trying to use the onboard stuff and you know, being able to schlep programs across uh, SD cards and USB sticks and even do networking with its silly thing has just been an absolute boon uh, in, in doing stuff for the channel. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have to put you on the spot. Welcome to the spot. Thank you for all coming to see me. Um, 
I'm Taylor from the Taylor and Amy Show, which you most certainly haven't heard of. Um, I would not say there is any piece of technology that got me back into the hobby because I never left. <laughs> People were like, when did you get into retro computers? And I'm like, when they were just called computers. Because <laughs> I am an old woman. Um, but I'll tell you what got me into like doing it a lot more and doing it for a, a YouTube channel is everyone else on the stage and the excitement that you guys put into the videos and stuff. And I was like, there are other people who also seem to be interested in this and love it. My, it's retro. <laughs> if only we could package enthusiasm as a product and sell that. Yeah, and for me, it wasn't like a specific uh, like product or anything, uh, but uh, I used to watch Jiraga One a lot on YouTube, and seeing him just like go crazy and swear at things is what made me do the whole Crazy Ken thing, and that's what got me back into retro computers and making videos about it. So Jiraga One, if you're listening, thank you. Um, you know, as long as we're talking about YouTube, uh, do you guys have any pet peeves about this hobby on YouTube? It's really easy to get hung up in details when I think we're really trying to convey just the, uh, the, the, the joy of the creative human being, creative engineering that made these things. Um, so, but I will say uh, there is one thing that sticks in my craw, and Adrian, you've, you've, we've, we've agreed on this. People seem to misrepresent interlaced video incorrectly on YouTube every, like 99% of the time. They throw away a field, they mash the fields together into a ghosty mess. Um, is there anyone on the panel, is there anything about making vintage computing YouTube videos that bothers you, that you would like to see changed, anything like that? I guess the one thing that bugs me, and it's not super easy to control, so I let it go, is uh, filming a CRT. They flicker a lot, so if people can find ways to film CRTs without it flickering, that would be great. It would give me less headaches. And major shout out to Clint for showing me Digital Anarchive's Flicker Free plugin. That's what I used. That's what I used to remove all the flicker from CRTs. So shout out to Digital Anarchy. <laughs> I mean, I, Jim, good question. I'm a pretty positive person if you watch my videos, so I don't really come, I don't, nothing really bothers me. I just, I just take it is for what it is. You know, everyone has a different style on this stage of like making a video and mine are long and just rambly or whatever. And it's just, it is what it is. And I mean, that's what kind of makes it different. There's like this variety. So we're not all watching exactly the same content. I think that's, that's awesome about YouTube, if you ask me. It's the public access with higher production quality. <laughs> because we have smartphones that can shoot in 4K now. You know, you don't even need fancy equipment to make good quality video. Yeah, I think a lot of what ends up bothering me is myself. So <laughs> uh, being just a stickler for certain types of edits or transitions or, you know, CRT flicker or color and lighting or white balancing and trying to get the beige to look the correct thing. You can't have it too greenish or too reddish. It has to be the right kind of beige. Mm -hmm. And, you know, constantly wanting to change up the sets and keep it interesting for myself so I don't get bored making the same types of things over and over. So I think that, yeah, I, I just uh, get in my own way. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's an answer, but it's, <laughs> it's a thing constantly. Well, I'll talk a little bit about CRT wine mm. and the comments. It's, it's not the wine itself, it's the comments. <laughs> <laughs> about it. I've probably told this story a few times before, but I go through great lengths to try to remove any CRT whine um, in my videos, but I cannot hear it anymore because I'm 48 and I haven't been able to hear it since I was like 30. And so um, I have to look through and run filters and stuff on there. And uh, every video I spend, if there's CRTs in the video, I spend time doing that. And about one out of every three or four videos, I'll miss a little section. It'll only be like maybe two seconds long. It'll be a little clip in there, and there'll be a hundred comments about, David, why don't you ever take the time to remove that CRT wine from your videos? You know? <laughs> so anyway, I do take the time. I just yes. don't always catch it. 
like I try to avoid those comments by just applying that CRT filter to the whole video. <laughs> if there's a little bit of CRT, the whole video gets that filter. I don't even care. Yeah. I actually wonder if some of that's like a, a psycho psych, psychological thing that happens when people see a CRT turn on. Because like I can see it on the spectrograph. Like I notch mm. it out, and I still get comments about that too. So it's just like I'm wondering maybe if it's just for like the you way think the it's image psychosomatic looks essentially like psychosomatic. That's the yeah. word I'm looking for. Yes. Thank can you hear it, June? Can you hear this, the wine anymore? Who can hear I'm CRT hearing. wine in this room? I'd really like to know. Okay, I'd like to know that too. Show of hands. We're Who can getting see? a lot. Of ha oh, you too, even. All oh right. wow. I'm with David. I'm with David. I, I uh, if I put my ear right up to it, I can hear it, but not across the room like I used to be able to. Yeah, I can hear it from the back end of the monitor, not from the front. Yeah, yeah. Same mm -hmm. thing for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> The the day I stopped, the day I stopped hearing my flyback transformer was both a happy day and a sad day. Well, I mean, the other thing is, the only ones we can hear are the 15 kilohertz, so like CGA and analog stuff. But VGA monitors run at 31, and I don't. No one's going to hear that. So, do you maybe get comments about VGA monitors and the, the wine? I, I don't ever show VGA monitor. I don't even have a VGA <laughs> CRT. I don't even own one. Yeah, we were testing the Commander X-16, and I was like, David, this doesn't work on, the, on a VJ. And you're like, I had to go to someone's house to try them <laughs> to test the X-16. So, yeah, you don't have space. So uh, talking about things we, we pet peeves, um, one pet peeve is the uh, always ever-present pressure of monetization making videos on YouTube. For some of you, it is a viable career path. Uh, for others, it's a fun bonus, and for and some probably don't even. I mean, I think a lot of people also don't even care. Um, you know, does the pressure of monetization? How much? It's always there, so I'm not going to say if it affects you, but how much does it affect you? Um, I think this applies to everyone on the panel. Do you? Uh, are you when you're choosing a list of topics from your spreadsheet of 250? I'm sure. Oh, sorry, 256. Uh, <laughs> 255, five, five, you're right, count by count zero. zero. All right, I'll go home now. <laughs> um, does, do you pick them based on monetization? Do you pick them based on, do you care and don't care and throw that to the four winds? Uh, how does it affect uh, what you do? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say I just do whatever comes into my head. What's a spreadsheet? <laughs> So a few years ago, I mean, the uh, AdSense revenue was really good, and uh, I, I could have probably lived on just AdSense alone, and, uh, but it's gone down a lot. I think every YouTuber has mentioned that, and I'm probably making a third of what I made before. Uh, fortunately, I do have Patreon, so between the, the two, you know, I can keep going. But um, I will say that at the height of, you know, AdSense revenue, I had gotten to where I would just make whatever I wanted to, because I knew that... Um, I had enough subscribers that I could make a topic on whatever I wanted to, and uh, it didn't have to be uh, like if you make something on a rare computer and you know YouTube throws it out there as a suggested video, a lot of people are just going, I don't know what that is. I'm not going to watch that, you know, whatever. But if they see, oh well, that's the 8-bit guy. Okay, I'll watch that. But that limits it to my audience only. I don't grab any outside, you know, I don't grab any uh, people that are not my subscribers already, but I didn't care. I could make videos like that all the time because uh, I had enough subscribers and the ad revenue was good. But now that the ad revenue is bad, I've kind of gone back to looking at my list of topics. And I'm like, okay, which one of these are going to grab a bigger audience? Because uh, I hate to say it, but that's, that's kind of where we're going <laughs> back to now. So Oh, so, that so if I'm hearing you correctly, you're under, you're saying that you can make money doing this? <laughs> you guys are getting paid? <laughs> it's like the guy on We're the Millers, you're getting paid? Uh, <laughs> Tell me more. I, 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 you know, this, if anyone in here is a patron of mine, um, I announced this there, but I haven't really talked about this outside of there, but I have quit my job and I now do YouTube full time. Yeah. Nice. So. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Jim's question is, you know, very apropos, right? Because obviously this is my sole income now. And, um, but you know what? So far, I was talking to Clint about this last night, is like, I just continue doing what I'm doing. So I've always just gone in my basement and picked up random things and like, oh, I'll make a video about this. And I have no spreadsheets or lists or any inventory of what I even have. It's all, it's all in here. But I, you know, I hope I doesn't get to the point where I have to worry about, you know, that 
that kind of chasing the views. But Patreon, like David said, ad view or AdSense is in the toilet, and Patreon is the only way I could actually do this full time now. So I, I, my patrons to me are like literally allowing me to do this. So I kind of owe them everything right now. So I will, if they're like, hey, make a video about this, I'm like, okay, let me try that. But luckily they're very forgiving of every random thing I show, so. It's interesting, if, you're, if AdSense is down so much, uh, are, you, are any of you guys selecting videos specifically for your patrons on Patreon? If that gets you the most, you know, the most revenue or possibly I mean, the most eyeballs. I think Patri the patrons will be supporters whether, you know, yeah. they're doing it monthly, right? So they're not really taking away their pa their patronage because they're like, that video sucked. I'm, well, maybe they do. I don't know. Well, I actually have had that happen before. Oh, but that's <laughs> oh really? Was there a Dremel involved? Oh, I'm just kidding. Oh, shots fired. No, it's all right. <laughs> I'm gonna go out on a limb and defend David. I, yeah. Because not everybody makes their mistakes for the purpose of entertainment right. and keeps it up on YouTube for millions of subscribers. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. If I make a mistake, if I make a mistake, y'all don't see it. <laughs> um, but David leaves it up there on purpose, so thank you, David. I blow things up all the time and <laughs> I just leave it in, so it's fine. <laughs> because it's like, a f I could fix it later, you know, and someone fixed that machine. Yeah, but anyways. nobody cares about a 1970s dumpster TV that you pulled out of a dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> Shots returned. Whoops. All right, I'm gonna recycle this now. <laughs> yeah, I don't have super rare stuff on my channel, so. <laughs> Yeah. Did you want to say um, yeah, I think, yeah, it you know when looking at uh, you know monetization or what to do next, it's easy to fall into the trap of like analysis paralysis because in YouTube Studio, like when we first got into it, there's so many stats, so much information, and so like it, it got really wired up trying to like get tuned in. Oh, like there's this chart and this chart, this chart, this chart. The viewers do this, this, and this, and then. At the end, it's like my mind kind of like melted, and now I just try not to look at it at all because there's like so many stats that you it's can too add, much. You almost wonder if you're making the wrong decision. Yeah, like going for the short, going for the big hump versus the the long tail, and, and the stuff only like that. stat that I even care about out of all those stats that it gives you is the retention. I look at it and if like if people aren't watching this video all the way to the end, then I've failed, and I need to figure out what did I do wrong here. So that next video, people will watch it to the end. Cause, and, and I think if you just care about that one stat, it, all the rest of them will fall in line under that. Actually, it's funny. That, that does go back to the pet peeve thing. And actually, so Jim, is that the pass? if anyone in here is a creator, you know, putting yourself on YouTube, those passive aggressive things that the creator studio says, your video is not doing well because, you know, whatever. And it like has these really, I'm just, where can I turn that off? There should be a plug-in for Chrome or whatever to like hide that garbage. That's my pet peeve. And it, it's like, I don't need that. Yeah, like you block origin. I can like click this <laughs> element and just like block this. I'll send the feedback. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I've got one more question. So if people would like to start like maybe lining up, if anyone would like to ask some questions, line up uh, behind the Q&A mic. If no one lines up, this is going to be a very short panel. <laughs> um, and while people are lining up, I want to throw a curveball to the panel. I think... Uh, uh, I would imagine most people on the panel are into science fiction or representation of computers in movies. <laughs> and I would like to know what's your favorite or least favorite representation of uh, computers in movies is. Uh, they always get it wrong. <laughs> There's always the sound of a 10 meg MFM Seagate hard drive in the background of some high tech oh, data gosh, center. Gosh. Yeah. Right. Um, my favorite, uh, I'll start, is um, when Matthew Broderick in War Games steals the password from the secretary's desk. That's a real social engineering thing we, some, someone used to do. So, uh, um, so uh, anyone have any favorite or, non f or hated representations of tech in movies and media? Oh, I have one. Um, Peggy Hill's K-Pro. 
that? What was uh, Peggy, Peggy Hill? Hill from uh, King of the Hill? Oh, had a, she had a K Pro, oh. and then uh, it was not Y two K compliant. It was Y one K compliant. <laughs> <laughs> so then she bought an iMac G three. Okay. I could probably talk for an hour about this, so I'll just limit it to one pet peeve that I have. Um, in Doctor Who, he points his sonic screwdriver at the screen to hack the computer, which is usually on the. <laughs> <laughs> that, like the new, new Doctor Who. Yeah, in the new Doctor, the new Doctor Who. Doctor yeah, they didn't have computers in the old Doctor oh, Who, right. so you know. <laughs> yeah, that drives me bonkers. I guess mine kind of has a twist because I thought it was crazy, and then I found out that's actually mostly real. But. Uh, Jurassic Park, you know, it's a Unix it's a system. Unix. I know this. And they're going through like that 3D file browser. I thought that was all just computer oh. gr graphics for the movie, but it's a real file browser that like moves in 3D that you fly through the file cabinet. And I'm like, whoa, now I feel dumb. So corollary to that. He does that on a Quadra 800, not an SGI machine. So it's like, <laughs> wait, what? Oh, really? <laughs> And in the hmm. same movie, we have video conferencing, which is just a YouTube player, and you can see the bar go across <laughs> as it plays the video. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. Like when, he, when Nedry's like watching the doc security camera footage, and it's like a quick time player, and yeah. you can see the scrubber go to, yeah, I love it. I'd have to say my favorite, though, actually is from the original Andromeda strain, where they have the, uh, the bell inside of the teletype malfunctions because there's a piece of paper stuck inside the bell so they miss a major uh, alert in the plot line and this has actually happened several times with asr 33s over the over the years so it's totally plausible right. i thought that was really good attention, good attention to, detail. to detail that is it a good all comes attention back to michael Crichton. i was uh i think he already knows right. well but you know but like uh, for pet peeves on this in this regard, uh, obviously, war games are probably one of the best. No pet peeves there. But I think all of us, anyone in here struggles to watch stuff because we all kind of see the ridiculousness that happens. But my sister is involved in the film industry up in Canada, and she knows the director of that new Tetris movie. And she's like, oh, did you watch the Tetris movie? I'm like, no, because it's probably full of like fake crap. And she's like, no, no, they spend a lot of detail. So I watched it and took notes. And I was like, well, this is wrong. And I'm like, send this to the director. I'm like, next time, call me or one of us, and we will help you with the little details because it does matter. But I guess Clint said to regular people, they're like, oh, it looks real to me. So whatever. Pleasing 99% of the, the population, I guess. So on the bright side, for those that don't know, I'm kind of friends with Steve Malaro. He's the guy that does like Young Sheldon and the Big Bang Theory and whatnot. So he always calls me, he'll like call me up on my phone and says, hey David, I need, need to know something, we're doing the script, and, and so I'll tell him, oh no, we can't do it that way, or whatever. So we try to keep that as accurate as possible, but there's been a few times his prop guys have done stuff, and I remember I was watching one episode a while back, and they had an Apple Lisa keyboard in front of like a regular like 90s PC <laughs> and some guy typing on it. And I'm like, oh. so I was like calling him up like, what in the world? And he's like, oh my gosh, sorry, my prop guy did that. I didn't even notice. Like, <laughs> it'll never happen again. Like, those he are says. the details. <laughs> those matter. <laughs> That Nike movie recently that came out uh, had a bunch of that. It was like a PC with a Mac keyboard. I was like, what's happening here? Cats and dogs <laughs> living together. Wait, I've, do I've done that before. The comic strip Bloom County. Anybody familiar with Bloom yes. County? Yes, yes. And the character gets a Banana Junior, and that's his computer. That sounds like one of those Apple clones that I've been working on recently. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that was one of my favorites. Oh, I love it. Well, to wrap it up, I'll mention my favorite. Uh, I was utterly shocked in the second Matrix movie to see Trinity hacking into something with NMAP, and all four octets were in the correct range. Uh, she wasn't going to 978.354. It's crazy. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's open things up to uh, questions. Uh, just walk up and start asking, and whoever, if you're addressing to, the whole, uh, to a specific person, please mention who you are. Otherwise, we'll assume all the questions are for the entire panel. Did you want a quick intro first, or do you care? I've, if it's up to you. Okay. Well, the name's Gord Fest at Great White Retro. So I'm an up. I'm a tiny little YouTuber, 180 subscribers, and I've been approached. I've been approached by PCB Way already. Oh. <laughs> wow. Oh, congrats. That never happens. <laughs> okay, I've already asked a couple of you in person, but I'd like a general consensus. Do I want to approach these guys? Do I want to deal with them? Yeah, they're on 
I don't know if anyone wanna, uh, That's a hard does anyone wanna answer that on camera? So, I don't know if any of us do PCB way. I, I don't do sponsorships in general. Most of us don't, I don't think. No, I do. Um, no, I'm <laughs> Okay. No, I, I, I do. They're nice. They're nice. Uh, I told I'll back you, you up. I do sponsorships too. There, we're buddies. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta bring home the bacon. We gotta and pay then the put bills. it right back into eBay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so it's kind of a. Hmm, kind I've of always worked my, my sponsorships in the very few that I've done have always been because I'll, I'll tell these people I'm like, look, I'll show your product as long as it's something that I need anyway and that I'm going to do anyway. So I did EcoFlow because I was going to buy those anyway. And I've done PCB Way a few times, not, but I've kind of got a special deal with them where I'm like, look, I'm not doing an ad for you, but I will mention, like like the last time we got Commander X16 boards made, it's like I will mention that we got these made if you guys want to do And they're like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll make your boards for free for you or whatever. So, I mean, I've done a few things for them, but generally speaking, um, if you watch, I, I've seen a number of these very high profile YouTubers. I mean, we're talking about the ones with 10, 20 million subscribers. I've seen a number of them recently say they're getting out of YouTube. And if you listen to their stories, the one thing you'll hear repeated over and over again was the biggest mistake they made was taking the sponsorships because they say over time it consumes the channel because the channel gets bigger. Now you have to hire more people. Now you need more sponsorships. Now you have to hire more people. Now you need more sponsorships. And before long, your all your videos are made to please your sponsors and not your audience. And then they're like, now it's not fun anymore. It's just a big job I've got to do every day. And so just be aware that that's where it could lead down the road. <laughs> so all right. anyway. Thanks so much. That's all I need. <laughs> <laughs> but we got more. <laughs> Hopefully this will be a fun one. Uh, so I watch a few of you. I do enjoy all your videos. Um, so what is your either favorite, least favorite, or most interesting computer interface that you've worked with? And it could be any kind of interface. Interface. Hmm. Are we talking about an operating system? Or, or, or like, you know, like USB or PCI oh, slot or okay. something? Physical oh. interface. Yeah. Serial, hands down. <laughs> nice. RS-232 all the way. Also GPIB. Oh. GPIB is so super weird. I will say uh, I do work in an embedded system. Serial is very nice because everything has a serial, like some sort of serial yeah. interface. Spy is the best. I'll say yeah. serial, second, 10 base 2. <laughs> That's spicy. <laughs> I'm going to say parallel. Oh, oh. <laughs> because uh, some of my fondest memories are building uh, a parallel port DAC so I could get decent audio out of a crap PC. I mean, I, I it's so weird because this is not retro. I mean, I love USB. I mean, honestly, <laughs> uh, as much as I love retro, like the fact that nowadays we can just like plug things in and they just work is great. There's so much. So USB is a double-edged sword for me. You're right. From a you end user yeah, perspective, end user it perspective. works great. But like people have asked me, David, why haven't you put USB on the oh, Commander X16? Wow. It's like, have you looked at the protocol for what it requires to support that? How much it does is the a, book cost or whatever? It is a nightmare. So from a programmer perspective, I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> USB files are nightmares. <laughs> Actually, I'll mention this one because it's at my booth right now. I don't know if it has a name, but on the next cubes, there is a port for the monitor, but it drives the video signal, the sound, the keyboard and mouse input, and the power for the monitor all over one cable. So that's pretty cool that you don't have to plug in a bunch of stuff. You know, that's some Steve Jobs wizardry. I don't know. So that's cool. Just don't know what it's called. I can't believe everyone didn't just say Firewire. In I was about to say Firewire. <laughs> Firewire is cool, too. I shot my first you know, YouTube videos on Firewire cameras. Yeah. <laughs> no one else? All right. Thank you. Firewire. Thank you. Yes. I've, I've watched a lot of videos from a lot of you, and you've covered, you know, you'd think you'd covered everything by this point, <laughs> right? But I have to say, and this is for you, Jim, you know, look at, look at his name tag, Trickster. Mine's Quarex, demo scene. This is the most important retro issue to me, and no one ever does a good job covering it. Who's got a half-finished demo scene video that I can browbeat, like just or patron or whatever Patreon? You know, does anyone anyone gonna do some demo scene? Because I just there's not not enough, not enough demo scene stuff. I did one a few years ago. 
Was it like a media David, stuff? What did you focus on? Called how the demo scene works. Oh yeah, you did. I think okay, I did watch, but then it was like it wasn't six hours long, and that's what I'm asking for. <laughs> So my question to you is, where are the intros for VCF? Why aren't we doing a demo scene here? That's actually a very good question. I did, me- well, I did mention growing pains before. Uh, that may be a reason. But seriously, like I hadn't thought it, about it. It actually this. came up uh, yeah. in discussion uh, once. We thought about maybe some sort of a little demo offshoot, but uh, let's address some, some larger growing pains first, unfortunately. No, that's the hey. one. That's the one we're going to do. Okay. I, w- I will add one thing, too, is that I put this uh, Adrian's... Um, Ape at Dance Party on my channel all the time, which is technically an intro, and the author of it is here at the show, and then the X16 version, the author of that is here at the show as well. So I play that all the time, and okay. it's like a mini demo scene. So I try. Okay. So we'll get there, is what I'm hearing. Okay, that's <laughs> all right. Well, I rarely uh, have the opportunity to talk about the demo scene at a vintage <gasps> computer event, so I'm just going to use this opportunity to say, "Demo scene represent." Thank you. Um, and uh, there is actually one person uh, who covers the demo scene quite a lot. Uh, his name is P.S. Enough. Huh. Uh, if you look for P.S. Enough on YouTube, you'll find his, yeah, type, type, type. Uh, you'll find his channel. Um, he uh, is also, he's been in the scene for just about 25 years now, and he does an incredibly useful service, a monthly demo scene report where so you don't have to go to all you don't have to go to all the party websites you don't have to look at all the top productions uh, and he'll break it down by month and if there's some special interest thing he'll also cover that too like here are you know there was a shader compo thing or there was a uh, uh, like he'll do special coverage of love bite which is all demos that are 256 bytes or less <laughs> size coding is awesome <laughs> Um, so yeah, so there's one person, okay. and you're right. Uh, oh, uh, you know, actually, some of the individual groups also have their own channels. Uh, Fairlight. Uh, if you look up Fairlight, um, although some their content is mixed between demos and uh, uh, cracking, uh, <laughs> but uh, and then they go into the history too. So, well, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I do want to add. I didn't see Area 5150 anywhere on the show floor this time. I, I, WTF? Like, I, so, I, I run the show. I, I can't I make an exhibit. <laughs> Area 51. Out, so, we'll so somebody yeah, with a PC. Play and, it on this PC right no. now, on loop. <laughs> I, I, I task you with browbeating them into doing so. <laughs> hey, I did that at VCF West. I started running Unreal on, on a bank of PCs out there as much as I could. Fantastic. Thank you. I mean, I go around and say, why aren't you running pesky robots on this? Why aren't you running pesky robots on this? <laughs> 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 and I'm like, the 8-bit eight, dance party should be on all of these 64s here. Get that pesky robot did, off of here. I did see the 8-bit dance party at uh, VCF Southwest. Someone was running it, and uh, I thought to send you a picture, but no, I forgot. No, I got, I got videos from that, actually. Oh, okay. yeah, I'll bet you I think maybe ton. Kevin sent me some video. Uh, hi, I'm Rob. I, uh, I've been watching uh, several of your channels for quite a while, and it's, you know, it's a thing I know... I know some of our vintage computers myself. I thought, you know, what if I wanted to get into this? I'm just curious, like, you know, I understand the technical aspect of, uh, you know, working with the computers. I'm curious about your kind of different stories about uh, learning video production, teaching that to yourself. Obviously, it's a lot easier, you know, like compared to 15 years ago. And, you know, that's kind of the area where I'm like, where do I start? Where do I put my shovel in the earth with that kind of thing? I Googled. Free video editor Linux. <laughs> and DaVinci Resolve came out? I software. then downloaded something. I then put the name of that video editor into a YouTube search and watched two videos on how to use it. And That's all? <laughs> Just Google High production Premier quality is what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, my, my story starting off is similar. You know, I had an iMac and... There was iMovie sitting in the dock, and I'm like, well, what does this button do? And you click it, and you know, the eyesight camera turns on, and it's filming my face. And I'm like, ooh, I can make videos with this. And I just taught myself how to edit from there. Uh, there we go. Now I made a career out of it. Thanks, Apple. <laughs> yeah, funny enough, my first videos were edited also on Linux, Kden Live. Yep, yep. Yeah, oh. yeah. Uh, and then I filmed my first videos. I just had my cell phone duct taped to a tripod. <laughs> and, and that was my production. Caden Live, duct tape, cell phone. Got to start somewhere. Yeah. Those are the videos you're showing off your tats and only your tats <laughs> in front of the, and the computer. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Hi. So um, I have a question for kind of like everyone. Um, so 
What is your least favorite video that you've put out, whether it's currently on your channel or not? <laughs> Actually, Ken's gonna love this. I mean, I'll go, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know if I want to talk about it. So oh, well, you go I, first. I, 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 would go, I was just gonna say the answer that I think a lot of my colleagues here have is that you go back and I watch my old videos and they're cringy, you know? <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, you know, going back to the editing. It was just bad everything. And, but I guess that's part of the process, so I leave them up and I just don't watch them much. <laughs> yeah. And other people comment on them occasionally. I'm like, wow, someone else watched this. Amazing. I guess uh, for me, um, yeah, when you see your old videos and they look cringy, that me means you're learning, so you're doing something right. Uh, but when I talk to my viewers, even just at the show now, several of them come up to me and say, hey, I love the new stuff you're doing, but man, I really liked the stuff you did like 10 years ago. And I understand that, because yeah, I watch some channels and I still like the old videos on those channels. Um, but some stuff that uh, <laughs> that I'm not so happy of about is like when I try a new style. Like a, a couple years ago, I tried vlogging. I tried going to like tech and like broadcast conventions, and those completely sucked. Like years later, they only have like 3,000 views, and I'm like, wow, this really sucks. Uh, I'll leave it public. You know, people can watch it if they want. But uh, yeah, sometimes just trying something new and seeing it doesn't work is kind of like, Ugh, but you, you move on. I would just add, like, I think every viewer has something to complain about a lot of times, unfortunately, yeah. about your style. <laughs> and Clint said something really flattering to me once, and he said, I get comments that say, your videos should be more like Adrian's. I was like, whoa, <laughs> whoa. I'm like, all right. But, but then I, I get, you know, the same things. Oh, your videos are too rambly or long or whatever. So I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah, different strokes, different folks, right, or whatever they say. <laughs> I just want to say from my perspective as a viewer, I know this isn't realistic in terms of monetization or ad revenue or whatever, but ideally I would say always go for the long tail. Always find the most obscure thing, make a video on it, because you don't know if there's anybody else out there who's recorded it, who's documented it, and that should exist. And even if it's not something I'm personally interested in, I'm still glad it exists because somebody will be, and it's, it's out there for people to see. So I guess it just, Sucks that you can't do that because <laughs> that's the kind of stuff I like to like to see. So, yeah, I I think we are going for the long tail, and I think it's exciting when we have a video idea and there's not a video out on YouTube at all about it, and so it's like, oh, we could make the best video on YouTube about this because there's no competition. <laughs> so I was saying one one time, David called me. He's like. Oh, you just put out a video on like the Laser 128. I'm about to put out a video on the Laser 128. Uh, so when if you you know one of your colleagues beats you to the punch, you're like, damn it. Yeah, well, I mean, it was like fairly recently. I put out a video on the eye opener system, and then you have one, and Michael M J D did oh, a yeah. video on it, and then like two or three other people showed. Oh, I have one too, and it's like I put this thing off for like 12 years, and all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna do it this week because I got nothing. To, oh, this is perfect, and yeah, all of a sudden everybody's doing it. So I don't know how that happens. But uh, yeah, the, the importance though of having stuff being um, just the, the long tail to it, that's honestly where most of my views come from. Just going back to what was said earlier about worrying about the week to week numbers, I, I kind of had to stop worrying about that because I don't know how it's gonna go. You know, some of my most popular videos month to month are things from seven or eight years ago that I personally wouldn't watch anymore because I, you know, even stuff from a year ago I find hard to watch of my own sometimes, but yeah. Uh, you can't really think too much about it in that sense, especially when it's something like, I don't know, you're doing some weird project or putting doom on a calculator. You never know if it's going to take off. And uh, one thing uh, in like the YouTube educator space we study a lot is called packaging. So it's uh, mostly the focus on the thumbnail and the title. And uh, whether you like it or not, as a creator, uh, the thumbnail is more important than the video. If no one clicks, no one's going to see the video. So it's kind of like... It's a form of marketing. So if you're going to be doing an obscure video and you think no one's going to know what it is at all, well, make sure the, th the title and thumbnail makes it more relatable. So then they go click through and then they go, oh, this is actually pretty cool. It's, okay, it's, everybody in unison make thumbnail face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on top of that, I do have to say deliver on your promise in the thumbnail and the title. You got to still be honest in your video. You don't, you don't want fake clickbaity stuff. That's not cool. Mic drop. Boom. <laughs> 
Yeah, the other day, I, I was in my backyard taking a picture for a thumbnail, and my neighbor was talking over the fence. What are you doing? Because <laughs> I was like holding the computer up, and I was like, I'm making a thumbnail. He's like, why? And I'm like, it's like a book cover. It's, yeah, that's the most relatable thing. You right. go into a bookstore, you see the good book cover, you're like, oh, I'm going to look at this. If it's a crap book cover, you know, good way no to one's buying. I, I didn't actually, the uh, the teddy bear that I have up there, the, the bear itself was another one of those. I was doing it outside, cleaning it off, and I had it in the front yard. Um, just sort of blowing it off and, and the, I didn't notice because the compressor was on the mailman came up at the mail and he said everything okay buddy? <laughs> I was like yeah this looks really really odd but that wasn't for a thumbnail that just kind of ex- I don't know it's a reality of this it is challenging sometimes I mean I'll I, the thumbnail's the last thing I do so I'll make the video and then I'm like now, how can I make a thumbnail about this that's going to excite people and tell them what it's about? And I, I hate clickbait, so I'm not going to do right. something like, the thing you've never seen before, or you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, you know, eight things you didn't know about, whatever. I hate that kind of stuff, List so I never do that. But it often leaves me like, sometimes I sit there for 24 hours because I usually release the video to Patreon, and then 24 hours later I release it to the world. And so I have that 24-hour period to come up with a thumbnail, and sometimes I'm not terribly happy with what I come up with. Um, but you know my YouTube. Um, what do you call them? The the person you're, you you oh, talk to. Relation person. Whatever they are, yeah. the rep. Yeah, Only they. The big channels have that. Not they that. told me like two years ago they were going to roll out this feature where you could. It would auto do it for you, right? Or no, you? no. They said I was going to be able to. Comparison thing. Yeah. They're working on it. It's in beta. They said I was going to be able to upload multiple thumbnails, and then YouTube would decide which one got more clicks, and then make that the thumbnail. But I. Okay. But yeah. So apparently this exists if you have big enough channels, but not big enough. Not, you're not big enough, yeah, I guess. They haven't given it to me yet. I saw. You have it, Clint? <laughs> no, but we talked about it with the guy. Oh, yeah, okay. like after a while, they for some reason they just give you a person to talk to in an awkward Zoom call, <laughs> and like he's just like, <laughs> you know, no offense to the last person I talked to, but yeah, it was uh, very obvious that he had no clue what my channel was about or how it even succeeded, or you know, he was just like. You seem really passionate about what you're doing. Uh, that's that's good for you. That's good for you. Yeah, you're like I'm not a prank channel like all the rest. <laughs> like you know, it basically just ended like if you ever need anything, but you seem fine. Goodbye, and I haven't heard from him since. So. <laughs> okay, where do I begin? So going back to what you were saying earlier about like you know like obscure stuff and like. Worried. I actually have like one, uh, what is it? what's that word? One test, one challenge for, uh, sorry, I'm. Okay. Take your time. It's a crazy show. It's yeah. totally. This is what happens it, to me. Uh, when okay, I'm actually, totally retro, because I got inspired by your video of the, <laughs> uh, the, Alan, Br- the Alan Bradley uh, industrial computer. I'm like, Here's a more boring challenge, uh, like an IBM or NCR cash register, point of sale cash register. <laughs> Especially since they were actually like, uh, a lot of people would have uh, to get more, uh, get Windows XP support longer, they would actually try to hack Windows XP to use the uh, extended ver- the version for cash registers. Yeah, I've seen people you do that to ATM, right? So those ATMs run XP and they're like yeah. running Doom on them. Didn't you <laughs> or, you like, uh, or like an ATM, like a, Someone else oh, yeah. had a video on running Doom on one of those. Yeah. Somebody was just telling me the, how they were able to take old, um, like, gambling equipment and, you know, run old OSs on there, mm-hmm. OS2, or even, you know, get Doom on there. And he was like, if you ever want to run that, then, you know, I love those kind of challenges. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised so many people found that video interesting, <laughs> that Alan Bradley machine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I personally found it interesting because uh, that's actually, Alan Bradley's kind of like the big tech company in up in Milwaukee. Mm, it's like the, the computer company up and I actually work with Alan Bradley because I run, uh, I work at Six Flags. So. Wow. <laughs> cool. Thank you for your question. Uh, okay, I think I've seen a few of you do videos on this, but I'm curious, how do you recommend dealing with burnout, work-life balance, and still like keep this fresh and, and interesting and, and want to keep doing it? I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. And speaking personally, that's sort of a constant struggle. So I've experimented with, 
you know, working at home in a, a different environment. Like I'll put the, you know, the computer outside and just work out there or go down the street and work somewhere else. But, you know, during pandemic, that kind of stopped going different places. So then I was stuck at home again. And then so I'm like, OK, I'm renting another uh, facility. And I started working over there. And that really got in the way of the, the quick creative process because it's like I couldn't just go back and forth between my main computer and what I was working on because I'm at it in a different location. So then I put them back in the house and then, yeah, that just started spiraling in terms of, oh, I'm just working all the time and it's hard to turn it off. So then I moved and now I've put another, like it's a different thing where I'm trying an upstairs downstairs situation where I have work down there and then home up here. Currently that's okay. But we'll see what it's like in a year. <laughs> I just try my best. Yeah, I would say I do something similar. Like, you know, I have to do a lot of writing for my stuff. And, like, I'll go to a coffee shop or a library or something. And it's just a change of environment is nice. Uh, a thing I've experienced a lot lately, and this is hard to do when you're a smaller channel because money. But... Um, we have a, an expression in the entrepreneurial world called hire your weakness. So I've noticed I've been spending a lot of time doing research and a lot of time doing like mundane post-production tasks when I really need to be spending that time and energy on more of the creative process and the forward planning. So I hire a guy now to do my research for mo mostly every episode and I hire an assistant video editor too. So delegating those tasks takes a lot of pressure off me and helps avoid burnout. So. I'm usually pretty excited about the videos that I'm making. I mean, when I have the idea, I'm like, ooh, this is going to be great. But during the process of making it, it often, nothing ever goes right, right? So it, <laughs> it can get extremely frustrating. And it's like, okay, I'm two weeks into this. Nothing's going right. And I get really frustrated sometimes. And, you know, that's when I start asking myself, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, am, I, am I tired of doing this YouTube thing? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I am tired of doing it. Then I always ask myself, it's like, well... Do I want to go back working eight to five for somebody else? <laughs> no. So I guess we're going to push forward and appreciate. We're going to appreciate what we got. So that's that's kind of every time. That's kind of my litmus test to determine like if, if I'm still good with YouTube because if I don't want to go back to that, I guess I'll keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and for me, obviously, I don't script like these guys do. So. If I weren't making a video, I would literally be doing exactly the same thing down in the basement, fiddling with this old stuff, trying to fix it. So it's literally a manifestation of just turning on cameras. And then I have, I was talking to Clint about this last night too. I end up with so much footage and then I just edit it down into something that's consumable. But it's literally like, I hope this goes good. If it doesn't, I'll still release it and then the computer will be dead at the end, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so. The reality is for me is even now I'm doing this full time and it's not been as long as these guys, but I really love it. It's like a hobby of mine that I'm now able to make a living off of. I'm like, that's a win-win for me. The other thing for me at least is having hobbies that aren't monetized <laughs> yeah. and aren't part of videos. And I, yeah, there's things that I just, I love doing and spend all my time with outside of videos that have nothing to do with vintage computing or any, I just don't film it. I would love to in a way because I'm really passionate about some of these other things. But uh, yeah, there's just, it's not uh, something I'm willing to compromise on because. Do and I also both know yeah. that when you're filming your hobby, it kind of sucks all the fun out of it. It does. It really <laughs> it does. does. This show is actually one of the few times each year that I get really like pumped about seeing all this stuff again. Because otherwise at home, it's like, oh, it's another monitor. Oh, it's another one of these. <laughs> like, oh, another monitor? I could fix it. <laughs> yeah. I got to send that to Adrian, you know. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like oh, another thing from. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I helped David one time fix that thing and didn't even fix it completely. So, yeah, spoiler alert, the arcade thing still. Still needed repair after me. And even more repair after I... Oh, it did. After I broke the neck on this. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> that happens, really. Uh, hi, all. Um, just out of curiosity, since we all kind of tinker as well, like vintage tech, what do you guys see or are you guys excited for the future of, of when the tech that we have on our wrist and our pocket become vintage tech? Or are you scared because Apple is locking everything down and it's getting harder to repair and just tinker with things because we don't own it? Personally, I'm very excited because it means more topics for videos. It'll never end. So I'm okay with that. I'm really worried because as that stuff ages, it means I'm also aging. So yeah, that's my big concern. I mostly worry about the servers and the apps being reliant on servers and services 
and things that are all like, you know, I have stuff from just a couple years ago that doesn't work anymore because of that. Uh, and also uh, so many things of the past five to six years with built-in batteries that are starting to bulge and pop out. And that causes damage now too. Like there's, you know, people with really interesting phones and uh, tablets and other portable devices I've seen where there's, they're sitting in their collection just in a cold storage room in the dark and they go back in there and there's like four or five of them that have popped just a few years old. Building on top of the server thing super quick, I just got to say, because like, I do a lot of history-related stuff on my show, So, and the unsung heroes of those uh, episodes are the people that, like archive all the stuff on the internet archive and like scan you know all the manuals and archive the ISOs like that stuff is super helpful <laughs> so keep doing that <laughs> so I have kind of a unique perspective on this because I worked on Google Glass which you've probably heard of Ooh, someone um, one. Yeah. yeah somebody was running around with it earlier it was yeah. really cool it still works so, um, but the thing is that we had a lot of our applications written as web applications mm -hmm. and we shut down some of the servers so that those don't function anymore. And so when that happened, our devices just stopped working. And you know, I see a lot of systems being built this way now. And so my concern about that is like it's slowly turning into cruft that we can never fix again. So people who are reverse engineering these APIs and these services to bring things up like Quantum Link, like um, some of the older stuff from the 80s, I'm hoping maybe we can preserve enough information about our modern stuff so that we can do that as well. And keep these things alive as well, because like this is our history. This is where we're locking our photos and all of our information into. And if we can't bring that back up, then we've lost something of ourselves. So before I head into my main question here, I did want to mention I fully support the right to repair movement. Just to give a brief aside of that. <laughs> Thank you. Anyways, my question here, I um, kind of it kind of is about all of you guys regarding the general business side of your YouTube channels. Um, Dave, I don't believe you are part of one, but do you guys, or do any of you guys, part of a multi-channel network? And no, never. <laughs> That is an old thing that used to be a good thing, but it is not good now. They take a huge percentage of your stuff, and a lot of that stuff's shutting down anyway. So sorry to interrupt you. I'm just very passionate. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> honestly, I was what, honestly that was the second part of my question. If you're not part of an MCN, um, why are why do you justify your decision? Thank you for answering that. First of all, but what about the rest of you? I mean, I, it's, it sounds. I, I don't know much about it. Thank you for your passion, but. <laughs> I would agree. It sounds like the sponsorship thing, but multiplied. And I don't need someone telling me how to run it's, my channel. It's or... so much worse, man. Wow. Okay. So I yeah, a, I've oh. been a part of five of them. Whoa! Really? Let me guess. You were part of Channel Awesome back then, right? I was not, but uh, I started off. I don't even remember what it was called. Maker Studios. N yeah, Maker was one of them, but it used to be, I think, the Game Polaris. Station. Polaris. Yeah, Polaris. That's what it was, and it was like the Game Station. But before that, it was Curse, and then they pushed me off onto the game station, and they pushed me off, and that turned into Polaris, which turned into Maker, which turned into Disney. <laughs> right, right. And like, yeah, every single time I got handed off to somebody else who knew less than the last person and, you know, offered less help, and the revenue was, you know, better in some ways, but not in other ways because they weren't transparent about it. And, you know, each one of them had pluses and minuses, but far more minuses. The only reason I took them on back then, which is back in 2011, uh, was because back then YouTube said my channel wasn't qualified for monetization because there wasn't enough original content, whatever that meant. So mm -hmm. probably because of gameplay footage and it was weird. So we took, oh yeah, I'll take a gameplay MCN partnership. So they took 40% of my revenue on top of YouTube, taking 45%. So it was down, 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 down. But hey, it was better than nothing, I thought. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> thankfully I didn't get screwed by some of the contracts because I know some people that were on other networks and their videos are still like held under this sort of escrow account on you know old content of theirs and they still can't access the revenue directly. And so, yeah, there's so many things, but you know, the funny part is, the only fun part is I still get uh, Disney residual checks oh. for about seven cents every six months. So I just, I just put them up on a bulletin board, so it's a bunch of Mickey Mouse, like, <laughs> Mickey Mouse heads for like seven cents each. It's great. 
And like right. back in the day, you know, that was like an acceptable thing to do was to get an MCN because you're know, building off of what LGR said. Like monetizing was very different back then. It's like much more accessible now. It's built into YouTube. But, you know, years ago you needed like an MCN typically, but it doesn't always age very well. I mean, look at what happened to Machinima. There were so many great oh, things oh, on okay. there that just like poofed because the network went down. I don't remember how it happened, but yeah, like you're kind of putting all your eggies in one basket and the basket sinks into a volcano. It's all gone. <laughs> I get an email at least once a day, usually two or three times a day from these companies, various yeah. ones. There's like hundreds of them out there yeah. wanting me to join know. them. And the thing is, you, you need to look no further than reading through the comment content of the email a little bit. It's like, it sounds like a Nigerian scam. I mean, the way, <laughs> the way it's worded and the way that they're addressing you, it's like a form letter. They don't even know who I am. And it, it's just, it, and it's like, I... I wouldn't trust these guys with a 10-foot pole. And they just immediately spam, 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 spam. And now Standard's going to pretty much taking that spot as well, too. So, But anyway, thank you. So uh, I'm an Apple II con you know, enthusiast. And uh, great show, by the way. I haven't been to this. Uh, uh, my question is, a lot of history and archives of Apple IIe, the distribution took place with where's and BBS. I guess my question is, what is your thoughts on that? And should someone on this panel at some point be from there? I think that's a lot of the history of uh, how software, which is a lifeblood of these computers at the end of the day. So I didn't hear a whole lot about that. I don't know if it's a taboo subject to talk about. I don't know if they're still being looked after by the feds or something. But I don't think sure. we really understand the question. It, 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 so it sounds like you're asking, um, how, do, how does the panel feel about wholesale copying of software for vintage systems uh, for an archival standpoint and a preservation standpoint versus a copyright or uh, you know copyright enforcement. Um, I've looked into that uh, over the years. Um, I was involved in the early abandonware movement, so that name should ring a bell. Um, every, it is still technically illegal. However, the lines are getting blurred every year. Um, there's a, a term a lawyer told me once uh, that is not a legal term, um, but it's one of my favorite terms. It's beyond economic recovery. <laughs> so if someone sees something they don't like, it costs roughly eh, $4,000 for their, their legal team on retainer to draft a cease and desist letter. And if the monetary item, you know, if they can't recoup more than $4,000 for it, they don't. So, you know, I'm not going to say if, if people should or shouldn't go out and, and copy software for saving it, but I will say that, uh, you know, as, as the generations of people who care about that, you know, leave, and um, as these items enter or beyond economic recovery, um, it's a blurred line that continues to get more blurred, especially since some of these companies rely on those very archives for putting out their retro compilations. Uh, several companies have been caught with ROM wears strings, it, strings in the ROM. You know, like it's clear that this was a copied ROM and not something official. So um, that's my take on it. I don't know. I have an interesting think. take on that. So especially being someone who sells software currently, I, I get emails probably at least twice a week. Somebody say, oh my gosh, David, did you know, look, your game is on archive.org. You've got to go do something about that right away. And I'm like, dude, I know that's been on there for like three years. I, I don't really care, you know, and they're like, but you're not getting paid for it. And I'm like, well, people, if they want to copy it, they're going to copy it. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be out there like worrying about each individual copy. Uh, most people want the box versions of the game. So, you know, as long as I've got those available and people want to buy them, that's great. But now going back to the, the, like what you would call like abandonware though, I kind of feel like if a company is not actively giving you an Ob an, an, an opportunity to buy the software from them. I mean, it's one thing they'll say, oh, well, you can buy it, but it's part of this, you know, proprietary piece Bundle of equipment or something, yeah. right? But it, like, like if I can't go out and buy a game for a Commodore 64 on floppy disk, if you can't get it anymore and the company, even if they're still around, if they're not making it available for you, I just don't see a moral problem with, with someone else making that available. I mean, if they don't care enough to make it available, then... What are they losing? They're not losing anything, you know. There, so, there, there are. I mean, there are a couple of 
legal ramifications for this. Uh, the, 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 um, the DMCA does have a provision for format shifting uh, the, the, the software uh, in case the original hardware is, is physically unavailable or can't run it. Um, but a lot of this is open to interpretation, unfortunately. And so is fair use of, of said software. So, um, See, I wasn't talking from a legal standpoint. Oh, no, you were definitely talking, talking from, from a moral, moral standpoint. standpoint. Yes, I agree. Yes, from a moral <laughs> standpoint, as someone involved in the, in the birth of the uh, abandonware movement, uh, I agree with you on the moral standpoint. <laughs> um, but just know your rights and, uh, and know your laws. Yeah. I mean, just a side comment. I think... Some of the splash screens on some of the games I played were better than the actual game. So. <laughs> <laughs> Demo scene news. represent. I think there's, we can't dispute that like some of the popularity of old computers, like 64, were helped by software piracy back in the old days. Yeah. Right? Like <laughs> Apple II uh, and the 64 especially and the Amiga as well, like copy parties. I mean, that was a big thing. And um, I, I grew up when I was young and I had an Apple IIc. I lived in Montreal. And Canada's copyright laws are different than they are in the US. Well, they were back then before the you know lobbies changed it all to make it the same. And there were stores that you could go to and they had like every piece of software pirated and you paid $1 to like rent it or something. And you took it home and copied it and brought the, that disc back. So I had like all this software for my Apple II was all pirated that came from this store. Legit. I mean, it was like a, a storefront. No shady mob-owned <laughs> money laundering. Speakeasy. It got shut down because, you know, the lawyers or whatever. I don't know how at all. It was just the Canadian mob. They were really nice. The, yeah, it, it's those the Hell's Angels. <laughs> They're like, we're going to give back to the computer community while we, you know, anyways. Yeah. So we've all been talking about 1980 series machines, but there's like a whole fleet of machines from 1960, 1970 that everybody sort of excuses from this as well. And those machines, unfortunately, had some of the tightest and most restricted licensing agreements in place. So there's a PDP-11 upstairs that's up for sale. And the problem with that machine is that all of the licenses for the operating systems explicitly stated, once the customer's done with that software, they must destroy it. <laughs> so we actually have time bombs in some of these machines that actually cause the destruction of what is our history as well. So without these people going and taking the illegal option and saving those tapes, saving those distribution backups, making copies of their system software, we wouldn't even be able to run these machines. So I think it's integral to, to keeping our stuff alive. Oh, I mean, and the accessibility of, if you're even trying to emulate something and you just want to play an old game that's now because of whatever the market of speculation of cartridges is like thousands of dollars. Well, I've never played that game. I, I mean, how else am I supposed to get my hands on it then? I got two other fascinating examples. So I actually covered this in a video a few years ago. I wanted to show this old camcorder on uh, hooking it up through Firewire to an iBook clamshell. And the problem I ran into was um, I could not find QuickTime for the, the clamshell because I, I couldn't record from the camera without QuickTime Pro, because back in the day, Apple used to give you a QuickTime player, but if you wanted QuickTime Pro, which had recording capability, you had to pay for it. And I looked for like, <laughs> I looked for a week and could not find it anywhere, uh, f you know, f for like OS 10.3 or whatever, you know, a, 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 a version of QuickTime that would do that. I mean, it's almost like it's lost to history. Um, likewise, I actually use this program, I think I've mentioned this to Jim, DCF, Disk Copy Fast. Has anybody ever used that? Um, I use that to make duplicates of both Planet X3 and Petsky Robots for DOS, and it was a shareware thing. And of course, after you've made a few copies, it keeps popping up this nag screen saying to buy you know, for a hundred, it's like a hundred bucks or something like that to buy a licensed version. And, you know, I actually often hire helpers to come over and help make these discs. And, and, and when you get to like 10 discs, it pops up and it's like, oh, you must register, but you can push like this key combination and it'll let you go again, you know? And they're like, well, why don't you just register? And I'm like, because the company doesn't exist anymore. And I cannot find like who to send the money to. Nobody has a copy of a registered version anywhere. If anybody has a copy, by the way, let me know. Uh, but I can't. <laughs> I, I would love to pay for a registered copy to this, but I can't. I mean, you know, WinRAR and all just that. Say. <laughs> I've tried with some stuff as well, and the company existed, you know, not that program, but another one, and they were like, oh, we don't support that anymore, so you can't, we're not, like, there's nothing I could do. They're like, sorry. 
Like they, they don't even have the, the old files, I guess, anymore. And they're like, well, we're uh, whatever they do now, still software. But they're like, the people that knew about that are long gone and too bad, so sad. So a cor corollary to that is actually, um, so DEC was bought by HP, Compaq, and they used to have hobbyist program for the VMS uh, operating system to run on Vaxxon. They terminated the program, and now no one could legally run VMS on any hardware that is older than, I believe, the Intel machines that they sell, or sorry, Itanium machines that they sell now. Really? Yes. It is actually illegal to run VMS on a real Vax. Wow. But of course, they're not going to go after you for it, because you're not making a mail Right. But yeah. still. <laughs> Thank you. Great question. Um, so as a creator, myself and all of you, like YouTube is this evil devil we deal with, but it's a way to share our passion. Um, if I were to hand you a magic wand where you could actually fix some of the problems with YouTube, what would be the problems you fix? Suggestions like, you know, people being able to subscribe to a playlist because I create some niche content as well. And if I know people don't like all my content, but they like playlists that I make of certain content. Maybe they like apples. Maybe they like Tierra Sadies. Uh, is there some features that you guys would like to see YouTube? Like, can we? Uh, I'm just curious. I got one right off the top of my yeah. head. Just really, uh, I'm not even going to say the word. Um, it, it irritates me to no end that I can make a um, 20, 30 minute long video. And if I have like a six or seven second movie clip in there, um, I will upload it and uh, they will, whoever owns the rights to that movie clip has now monetized my entire video, not just the seven seconds or so that was in there. And yet I see like other people, like you go search on YouTube and they'll just be like channels where they do nothing but upload like videos of you know, Family Guy and Simpsons and stuff like that. And they're monetizing them. How, wh wh why am I like getting, you know, this treatment from YouTube for like a few seconds of a movie clip and, and you got these guys uploading like whole freaking episodes and, and, and sometimes they're doing it with a freaking camcorder. So it looks awful too, you know, so with the camcorder on the screen, you know, there's an episode of the Simpsons, like that kind of crap drives me nuts. <laughs> like, why are they getting away with that? And I can't even use under fair use yeah. legitimately. <laughs> fair use is very broken on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and for me, cause I'm not the, I'm like mid-sized channel, I guess, or whatever. It feels like if you're not big and you're mid-size or smaller, YouTube can just do whatever they want and there's no recourse. And I had, you know, some of you probably know, I had my, one of my channels shut down by them because I was impersonating myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you write to them and you put an appeal in and they're just like, after careful consideration, you know, no. And so it, it, it took community outrage for that to get resolved. And that's scary for me because I, you know, I don't have the person I can call up like these guys do and like, hey, what are you guys doing? That person's useless. <laughs> they are. And, that, and that's part of it, yeah. But like, and I, I, for me, I get 1099s. I'm an employee, we're all contractors, you know, for YouTube. And yet, if you work at a normal company and there's a problem, they try to help you in HR, you know, whatever. But at YouTube, they're just like, F you. They, they couldn't help me either. I uploaded a video to 8-Bit Keys once and um, I had uh, done a little song for a demo on a keyboard and um, I had had it uploaded for a few days and then, you know, somebody had discovered a mistake and I hadn't actually released it to the public yet. So I deleted the video. I fixed this one little thing. It was just like a spelling mistake or something in a video. I re-uploaded it and suddenly content match. It's like oh, the one I had uploaded a few days ago, which is the exact same video minus the spelling mistake, had no content match, but this one does. And so I called up my rep and they're like, oh, oh, I can't do anything for you about that. So, <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're pretty useless. Content matching you? Like no, no, they specifically called out this little like uh, 20 second section where I had played a song on the keyboard as matching up. I think it was Axel F. Uh, and it was matching up with uh, the owner of that tune or whatever. <coughs> so. You play just, too well. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so endlessly frustrating. So I, I don't know. It's, it's, it is scary if you're thinking about going into this and really making money off of it just to know that it's like the worst. I mean, you think Comcast is a bad company when it comes to customer service? Like YouTube is literally the worst. I do want to defend YouTube a little bit. Um, YouTube does a lot for its creators that many people don't realize. Like we have conferences that are like run by YouTube 
employees. We, we, we get plaques when we get sub like 100,000 subs and millions of subs. Like, what other social networks do that? So it's hard because there's a lot of users, so they have a lot of messes to clean up. But I would say they probably treat their creators better than pretty much every other platform. However, if I do want to say one thing I'd like to have the platform change, this is a small thing, speaking of spelling mistakes and stuff, being able to upload in place a fixed video without having to re-upload it you know, from yes, scratch. Absolutely. And like, I know that's easier said than done because it took Twitter forever to get it in there. Oh, YouTube has it. The big channels do it. Yeah. Like LGR, not LGR. Yeah. <laughs> Linus, te Linus Tech Tips replaces so, videos like crazy w without yeah. uploading a new one. Yeah, like they in place. Yeah, they have that it must be a. They, maybe they're working on it with a like a yeah small. Like they do the music videos too. They like they put HD copies huh. in place of like the Rick Roll. Yeah. Apparently, I need to catch up on some oh, YouTube no. news here. You just got. You're just not big enough. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. There's so many times I find little mistakes after I've finished a video and I'm like, oh, it's too late because there's no way to replace it. And I don't want to delete the old one because now every website that's linked to that, yep. it's it's gone. Plus and the comments are gone. Like, yeah. Reviews, yeah I mean. and, and so, and if I re-upload it again, all my users are like, you already uploaded this. And I'm like, <laughs> duh. But, you know, yeah, they don't give you away. So that's, that's kind of why... Um, you know, it's set. It's kind of set in stone, and and if I made a mistake, it's it's going to be in there forever, even if it's just a dumb little spelling mistake or well, something. Well, and you know, summoning salt, huge channel, right? They had to re-upload one of their videos because it was like cursing, and they were getting all these complaints, Ooh. and they can't even do an in-place upgrade, and that's a huge channel with huge numbers of views. I mean, I, I sort of understand why they do it, you know, because I could see how that could be used and right. abused, but I think what the solution with that would be to to where there would be like you wouldn't be able to say like oh well i uploaded a video about that uh, 10 years ago see and and you know it's kind of like a permanent record yeah. and and you wouldn't want somebody to be able to go in there and modify that today to pretend they did something 10 years ago i get that but you could have like a, a history like when you go to look at the video you can see like maybe oh yeah this edit this has been re-uploaded here watch the old one here you know and as long as they kept like a, a record of that, I think that you could get around a lot of the moral quandaries on that sort of thing. Good point. We know they keep all the old content. Oh, yeah. They had everything. <laughs> I think part of the problem is we're talking about YouTube like it's a monopoly. Like, what we need competitors. There should be other ways to distribute content that we should try besides YouTube. I mean, the reality is people say, I hear that a lot too, but I think it's like there is what other platform can you monetize? your videos on and actually like have long form videos right. that make substantial amounts of money. Th there really aren't any. Well, you know, there's Vimeo and all these other ones, but I guess the problem is it's, it's kind of like a discoverability. You, know, you, you have to yep. like, yeah, it doesn't have the audience that YouTube has. All of them are yeah. just like, can you even monetize on Vimeo? You know. have to pay Vimeo you to You can't upload. monetize on Vimeo, yeah, so. <laughs> it, it's the inverse. You actually pay Vimeo to host your videos. For the higher quality Yeah, version. because they're, they're actually aiming for professional, like, videographers and, like, the really big crews. But, like, short of Odyssey, there's no other platform. Yeah. I have a channel on Odyssey, so I mean, my channel's mirrored there. So if anyone wants to watch there, you can. I mean, honestly, if I was going to change something in YouTube, it'd probably be a little more technical. It's just like, give me a way to do resumable uploads. Because <laughs> now that we're uploading like 4K, like these are multi-gigabyte files, and I've just got a little tiny straw of a pipe through Starlink, so like trying to upload just takes forever. To be fair, some of these problems are really U.S. copyright issues and law yeah. and, and laws. So write your write your congressman. Yeah, that Disney. <laughs> He's a Disney employee, I guess, now, at your seven cent checks. Residual They're checks. a big copyright problem. Yeah, yeah. My fault. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Hello. Uh, this, this is more for Clint. Um, I know you've done like three or four different overall topics throughout your shows. You even have a couple different channels. Um, out of the three that you do on your, or two that you do on your main channel and then blurbs, what are you, what's your favorite thing to do? In terms of overall topics, like yeah. uh, like subject matter, yeah, um, probably just finding a machine that I've never heard of and yeah. never seen anybody cover. Uh, when that does happen, once in a blue moon, and it all comes together, and I can actually find 
research and papers and magazines right. and newspapers and all that, and it all actually comes together and you can into build something. A nice story. Yeah, just the sort of meaty. Because I used to do the Tech Tales series, yeah, and it was really just that side of it. Missed but when I can study. find you know the machine itself and some of the peripherals and the paperwork, right, and all the ephemera that goes with these machines, that right there feels like a more complete sort of mini documentary type of thing and i feel like it's like fitting a piece of a puzzle that was missing from technology history exactly. yeah. uh, that's yeah genuinely that's cool, my yeah. favorite thing to do and of course whenever i can find stuff that hasn't been archived and saved and backed up like just slap it all in archive.org it, yeah. And yeah like man i found the drivers for this one stupid yeah. cd-rom <laughs> there, there it is yeah. and inevitably like one guy over in romania is like i needed it and there it is <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. No, yeah. i get that yeah uh, definitely that um so what about like your thrifting videos do you like doing those i love doing them i would wish i could do more That's uh, nice. yeah I'm it's it, it's yeah. one of those things those where are fun do as many as i can but yeah, like it, just a couple of weeks ago, I went on a thrifting trek in the area, went to four different stores, and I in, found, not here, here well, oh, okay. my area, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in North Carolina. Yep. Um, and, you know, it used to be a whole lot more uh, intense in terms of finding cool things. Right. And now, so many people know that's where I shop, and so they start making treks there, and people are coming from all over to shop there, too. So they're <laughs> finding so they things before there, I do. Right? And, yeah, so I don't find as much. And, I don't know, thrifting is just not what it used to be with places putting stuff up for auction and all that. Right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I spent the whole day thrifting and got about 20 seconds of footage. Oh. So it just takes a while. But no, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love doing those. Okay. Uh, one last thing. Uh, I need you to say something in John St. John's voice. Oh, well, I can't do John St. John's voice, but I can do mine. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Hi there. Uh, first off, I want to thank you guys for taking the time to do this panel. It's been really enjoyable, so really appreciate it. Um, kind of going back to the previous question we had, we are talking about what we change on YouTube. Um, I guess there's an elephant in the room that we haven't talked about. YouTube Shorts. <laughs> How do we all feel about YouTube Shorts? I prefer cargo shorts. Yes. <laughs> Look at these shorts. I agree. <laughs> I was actually going to say that would be one feature that I wish you had was the ability to hide them. On mm. your, I'm not personally a fan of seeing them all in the same spot. I wish there was a separate timeline or feed uh, for my own subs because, you know, sometimes I, like I don't mind seeing them on certain occasions, certain tub, uh, subjects, but I don't want to see them right beside all the other ones because mostly I watch on my TV or a bigger monitor that is this way, not this way. And it looks kind of silly that way. So, you know, it's like, ah, I gotta be like on a plane or a bus or something to, to want to watch shorts. So I wish you could separate them more easily. There is an extension actually. I don't know what it's called off the top of my head, but it does change all shorts into normal videos, so. But on a TV though? Yeah, yeah I mean. Yeah, yeah. So I have a kind of a fundamental problem with YouTube Shorts and TikTok and other things like that, Facebook Reels. And while I am guilty of occasionally watching them when I have a few minutes to kill, and I'm like, well, I don't have time to work on a project. I got five minutes to kill. Okay, I'll, maybe I'll watch something like that. But for those that don't know, I have a daughter that's 20 years old. And to my knowledge, she has never seen a movie from beginning to end all the way through. And it's because, and it's not just her, her friends as well like they all like they watch these little shorts and if you give them a movie to watch uh though of course they're watching it on a tablet or a computer or whatever uh she sits there with her hand on the mouse and every minute or two she just skip forward five minutes or whatever when, whenever it starts to get a little boring she just skip 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 and she'll watch a whole movie in about 15 minutes and i just feel like modern kids their attention span is not capable of you know, like like when we grew up, we not only did we have to wait for our show to come on at a particular time, we had to wait through <laughs> commercials and everything else just to see to the end. And I feel like this old uh, man energy is great. I'm loving this. Like, this is. <laughs> you know, but I just kind of wonder what it's doing to our children's brains, like killing their attention spans and ability to process things the way that humanity has grown up doing. I don't know what the repercussions of that are going to be long term. It's a rapid change and I haven't adjusted to it myself. Like, I don't know. I don't know. But it is very addictive too at the same time. Yeah. Like I see how it's addicting. It. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and the content I make and I think a lot of our, my colleagues here do is it just doesn't work in a one minute video. Like, how am I going to fix a monitor in a minute and give it any kind of useful information? Don't touch here. Put this there. Okay, it works now. Wait. Ooh. <laughs> 
Um, as a smaller creator myself, uh, everyone always recommends you should use shorts and try to get more views and stuff like that. So I tried it. And uh, those shorts definitely got more views, but they got exponentially more hateful comments and <laughs> what the hell is this thing and stuff like that. And so honestly, I was really put off by it. So, you know, it wasn't worth the... 1% subscriber uptick for it, so. Well, and our people who subscribe because of a short are going to watch long videos anyways? Yeah. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, I'd have no intention of ever really making shorts myself, but uh, I guess also just to kind of make a funny comment, uh, David, when are we gonna get to see you destroy another Fisher-Price keyboard? I couldn't hey, figure hey. out how to open it and I got really angry at it. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't like the keyboard anyway, and it was certainly not a collectible thing, so yeah. It was a funny video. Anyway, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Oh, oh like questions please, question, for Taylor and Amy. Oh, questioner, please, oh, and, please introduce yourself. Well, I'm sorry? Oh, oh, questioner, please introduce yourself. Really? Hi. Yes, really. I'm Bill Hurd, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Hi, Bill. He's the guy with, for the jail bars. I don't know. <laughs> C-128. That's the first thing I said to him. Sorry about the jail bars. Oh, I'm like, those jail bars. So, question for Taylor and Amy. What's, do you have any uh, test equipment you're particularly proud of? Uh -huh. Yeah. An oscilloscope, you say. <laughs> and I totally have one of those. Do, and what would you say you do with those oscilloscopes? Oscilloscopy. <laughs> Yeah. With sculptures, we're doing a pivot to a full time failing to get oscilloscopes to work and buying new ones in the <laughs> hopes that they work. And, and so far, it's, it's, it's that stack's getting up there. Thank you for that question. You're welcome. I thank set them up, you bring them in. Yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, kind stranger. We've got time for about two more. Sounds good. All right. Uh, first of all, this is just for Clint. Um, if you're ever in LA, there's a bar called Residuals, um, <laughs> where you can where you can take your check for under a dollar and get yourself a free beer on Disney. So <laughs> there you go. And they'll I put have, it up on the wall. I have actually heard of that. And I, I never there. thought about doing that. That's a that's a great there idea. There you go. Yeah. How many free beers do you have on Serves, the wall? <laughs> Serve yourself. Oh, he's a lot of free beers. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Yeah. All it's beers for everyone every, right. <laughs> on Disney. <laughs> Um, but this is for all of you, and it's just, um, well, first of all, thank you to the VCF Midwest staff for bringing it all here. And for putting it on a, and for putting all, putting on a great convention. And just, what do you, what, what's, your high, what's your high points of the convention? What do all you like, like to do? What do you, what do you, what do you I, appreciate about this I did not put him up to place? this. I did not put him up to this. <laughs> Figure for the SGI and. stuff. There's so SGI much good stuff. SGI stuff here. Yeah. Well, I'll take one. So, yeah. Amy's talking. I'm talking. Yay. Yeah. Uh, I know. Well, we have one microphone, so we. <laughs> but just the people. Like, you know, yeah. even when we came last time, we got to meet a, a bunch of cool people and coming and interacting in person and hanging out with these guys over here and, and meeting new people that we met on the internet, too. It just, <laughs> it, it's just really fun. Like, I, I think le less the stuff and more the people. Is is real? I mean, that sounds corny, I guess. But I look forward to meeting, hanging out with the folks more than probably any particular thing. Although we got this Avon computer last night. Avon computer. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I. It's funny, you know. You people come up to me and they're like, "Oh, it's so great to you know finally meet you," and, and, and it's like, I don't get to see my viewers, nor these guys either, right? And so it's. I, I hardly look at the other exhibitors, and I really need to because there's so much cool stuff to see. I love just seeing people come up to me and like get to meet people face to face, viewers, fans, all those things. It's it kind of helps me validate that what I'm doing is worthwhile. I guess. Yeah. All right, I guess uh, my name is Steven. I uh, just wanted to comment a little bit more on the YouTube shorts. I've used them, and I think I've gotten some value. I think 
like in your space, it's probably only useful if it's there's like a piece of information you can pull out that obviously fits in under a minute that is either answers or asks a, a good question. And I can see for a lot of, your, a lot of folks out there uh, on this panel that that probably isn't very often the case. Um, I, I do a lot of discussion, so it's a little easier for me to pull something out of there that answers a question or asks a really good question, toss in some video relevant to that, and sort of put that together in a short. So I've had a little bit of success. Also, honestly, I, I think it's probably something that helps n channels that either like mine, to be honest, are, don't have a huge fan base with a lot of expectations. <laughs> um, whereas I think your audience is, uh, on your channels are more like they have a very specific thing they want uh, long form ish content and stuff like that so seeing something else like that is probably too much of a curveball well I've, I've considered making some of my restoration videos into shorts i mean i think i think you i think i could pull that off but most of the other stuff i do would just it would just wouldn't make sense it was just you know like a documentary video on like a Commodore 64, I mean, that, that this, you just can't fit that in 60 seconds. Like, Commodore made a computer. It was 8 bits. It was sold really well. <laughs> the end. <laughs> yeah, I think the shorts are inherently hard to use for retro content because to do retro content, you have to frame it first right. before you show it. Whereas it's not like, here's a better way to cut an onion in five seconds. Yeah, so it, it, it really depends, and I'm, I'm not surprised that a lot of uh, the folks on this panel have had trouble finding something they think actually works there. So, And I think it's like a worthwhile effort, too, because how much time is it going to take to take a 40-minute you know, video of one of David's and turn that into something consumable? You're going to spend a lot of effort on that, and then what's the return going to be? Is it going to be worthwhile? I don't know. All right. Uh, we're out of time, but I want to thank, give extra special thanks to everybody up here. Thank you so much for participating. I want to thank all of you guys for attending the show, because without you, we wouldn't put it on. Uh, and that's it. So the auction will begin in roughly an hour in this room. So if you're interested in the auction, please come here. And thanks again.